You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to spice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. Just a reminder, as always, you can see the image of the work we're focusing on this week and every week. If you're listening on Amazon Music, GoodPod, Spotify, or any of those other platforms that support episode-specific cover art, and if you're enjoying the show, please do me a favor and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. In the middle of February 1981, a group exhibition opened at PS1 in New York. The show featured over a hundred different artists from the underground art scene. There were paintings, drawings, photographs, objects, and graffiti all mixed together in an explosive portrait of the post-punk scene. The show was called New York New Wave, and many affectionately referred to it as the Armory Show of the 80s. The Armory Show was, of course, the famous exhibition from 1913 that introduced European modern art to the American audience. This time, though, it wasn't European artists upending the New York gallery scene. This time, the revolution was coming from inside the community. Among the artists on display was a 20-year-old by the name of Jean-Michel Basquiat. He had previously made a name for himself as a graffiti artist. Although Basquiat didn't really consider it to be graffiti, he thought of it more as almost like a poetry project. It just happened to be scrawled across the walls of the city that he called home. Basquiat and his friend Al Diaz created a text-based project called Samo, spray-painting messages around New York. They were particularly active in the area where numerous gallery spaces were located. Basquiat was pretty critical of the gallery scene at that day. And Samo often sought to be a little humorous, but also giving an outsider's perspective of the art world, with phrases like, Samo as an end to playing art. Samo for the so-called avant-garde, or... Samo is an end to confining art terms, riding around in daddy's convertible trust fund company. So you get the sense there that with the Samo project, Diaz and Basquiat were calling out the same old garbage that the gallery owners had been trotting out. And, you know, there is this absurd sense of people with enormous wealth just passing around um, these works of art. You know, I, I'm reminded of the Salvador Mundi painting that made made record sales for nearly half a billion dollars. And I mean, it's hard to imagine anything is really worth half a billion dollars. Any one object, one painting, no matter how beautiful it is, and that's an ugly one. But it's this idea that, you know, the art world, the fine art world was this exclusive club of people largely just signaling their taste and their wealth and conspicuous consumption and all of that. But back to this show in 1981. Now, dropping the pseudonym, Basquiat was presenting his paintings on the walls inside the gallery rather than scrawled across the exterior walls of buildings and subway platforms. Basquiat had been popular among those in the know in the underground scene, but he was also penniless. As a teen, Basquiat had been homeless and couch surfing. He supported himself by selling postcards he had made. He had been encouraged to create more works to sell, and the New York New Wave show featured 23 paintings and drawings by Basquiat that immediately grabbed the attention of gallery owners and collectors. Just a year after this group show, Jean-Michel Basquiat had his first U.S. solo show and sold out in one night. He caused such a sensation, many dubbed Basquiat the Black Picasso. Sort of a backhanded compliment when you think about it. I mean, setting aside the fact that Picasso was a monster of a human being, he was a good artist. I mean, he was one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. 
And Basquiat certainly admired Picasso. But also there's something inherently diminishing to call him a version of another artist. Basquiat embraced a lot of things, but he didn't really embrace that nickname. He wanted to be seen as himself. In his work, he sought to assert his own radiant perspective rather than making a pale imitation of someone else's. While he never went to art school, Basquiat was a lifelong learner. He had gone to museums with his mother as a child. He taught himself about art and art history through books and wandering through the museums. In a number of his works, he paid subtle homage to artists he admired. For example, in his triptych, The Three Horn Players, we see a composition that in some ways plays off Picasso's arrangement of three musicians. The thing is, Basquiat didn't make direct copies of others' work. He filtered everything through his own style and left coded references like Easter eggs for the viewer to discover. He used hatch lines that mimic some of the textures of Picasso's work. He made a triptych, a three-paneled piece, in reference to Picasso's three musicians. But as I said, Basquiat made it his own. From his early roots in graffiti, words were always important to Jean-Michel Basquiat. Arguably, even further back, I mean, he was reading and writing at age four. He learned about art, anatomy, and other subjects by devouring books throughout his whole life. He was even fluent in three languages. Basquiat went through the world like a sponge, soaking up the sights, the words, the music, everything all around him. And he used those disparate influences to make something new and different in his paintings. In The Horn Players, we see he writes Dizzy, a reference to the jazz musician Dizzy Gillespie. Next to his face, we see the seeming nonsense words, Du Shu Diobi, which would seem to be a reference to scatting, the improvisational singing style performed by Gillespie. The word ornithology is a reference to another jazz musician, Charlie Parker. This one takes a little bit more background knowledge to get. Ornithology is the study of birds. Charlie Parker's nickname was Bird. It was also the name of a Charlie Parker song that was a little bit self-referential. Throughout all of this, we see Jean-Michel Basquiat using text and image, synthesizing his different interests and paying homage to different figures he admired. Part of what Basquiat sought to do was put his stamp on the Western canon of art history. He wanted to show his perspective as a young black man and lift up African-American pop culture. The thing is, Basquiat was not only enjoying the music of these jazz icons, he was learning from their approach. Parker, Gillespie, and other greats of the bebop era appropriated the structures of jazz standards, using them as a template for creating their own songs with some flourishes and improvisations. As a postmodern artist, Basquiat appropriated and remixed elements from all aspects of culture he consumed, rewriting history and inserting himself because, as Basquiat said, quote, I'm not a real person. I am a legend. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.